staying calm. He does this staying in our lessons. <laughs> he does this in our lessons too. He's calm. super what good. He's super good. He gives <laughs> insight into exactly what he's thinking. Oh my god. What? Okay. He seems All very right. calm. The mountain is a very strong chess player, but he's also very unfortunate because he went up against Wagamama, who is frickin' 1445? Oh my gosh. Wagam did, wait, has Wagamama been playing since then? What the... Wait, 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 one second. Sorry, I'm just going to take a look at Wagamama. One second. I just need to take a look at Wagamama TV's rating history. No, no okay, those, those were his games. Oh, man. Um, Yeah, 1445. Oh, man, that's pretty brutal. Uh, so what I was going to say in general terms is that um, is that uh, Wagamama is certainly someone. He's one of the OGs. He hasn't played chess in a long time, but he is quite strong. And so Hathor Julius, I think, was one of the early earlier favorites. Um, but unfortunately ran up against Wagamama, who I think he's going to get a chance to play against in, um, in, in, in the brackets, but tough first match. But that being said, uh, certainly Wagamama is one of the most dangerous players. So this, this game starts E4, C6, Bishop C4 played by Hafthor, um, D5. Now Hafthor plays Bishop E3, plays the Hillbilly Gambit, um, uh, which is reasonable. I don't really like the hillbilly gambit in general. I think um, at this level, it's a little bit dubious. What I would recommend for Hathor Julius, um, if he's going to play, again, Karo Khan, I already said what I recommended for XQC. So I probably would say, I would probably say much of the same for Hathor. I think something very smooth and slow, uh, maybe something like D4, D5. And now I can play like Knight to C3, guard the pawn so you can recapture. Um, so black normally takes, brings the bishop out. And now I play for a very smooth, simple idea. Bishop comes out, you go knight g3. So you attack bishop with the knight, goes back. And now you just bring the knight out. Black brings the knight out. You play bishop to d3, offer this exchange. And now you just castle your king out of the center of the board. Look to develop your bishop here and bring your rooks to the two central squares where they can attack in the center part of the board. So um, so what I would recommend is something a little bit smoother. Again, you got to be mindful of your opponent's first move. When they play this move, the idea is counteract the pawn in the center. They, wanna, they want... That normally, black could just play pawn here, but if you take, black has to take with the queen, and now white gets a big center. Um, whereas when black goes here, he tries to fight for the center, so if you capture, you don't have to recapture with the queen. You get to capture with the pawn, and it's a, it's a symmetrical center. So what I would recommend if, for half door is if his opponent plays this move, the idea to try and fight for the center, d4, d, not bishop c4, sorry, d4, d5, knight to c3, black takes, and if black plays a knight out, for example, again, more smooth, simple moves. I would actually recommend here, again, just go knight g3, black pushes the pawn, bring the knight out, bring the bishop out, and both sides castle. And it's pretty standard. Again, same thing. You want to bring the bishop out, bring the rook to the center, and try to fight for some play on all these central squares. So let's go back. Um, so Hathor does not do this. In this game, he plays bishop c4. Um... Goes uh, d5, bishop b3. Wagamama chooses not to accept the hillbilly gambit here. He decides to play pawn to e5. Uh, half door takes. Good move. Plays pawn to d4. Fantastic move. Bishop is on the diagonal with scope. Now you activate the lane for the other bishop to come out as well. So e4, knight e2, knight of 6 Castles, pretty standard. Knight c3, bishop g5. Fantastic move. Again, put pressure on this point on d5. You have 1, 2 attacking. Black has 1-2 defending. So if you can remove the knight, black will only have 1 defending and you'll win material. So uh, bishop e7 is played here. Uh, is oh, Wagamom is actually here watching. <laughs> okay, hilarious. Um, so what I would say, since I'm clearly going to have to start doing this for both sides, is actually Wagamom, what he should have done is in the Karo Khan, when the opponent plays like this, is he should have accepted the hillbilly gambit and played pawn takes pawn. After white brings the knight out, you go bishop f5. And the point here is that what you want to do is black can, this is a general concept, black can always push a pawn. But when you push a pawn like this, you close the diagonal for your bishop. Your bishop is behind the pawn. So you can actually bring the bishop out to guard the pawn, but then secondarily, let me just make a random move here. You can also go pawn here, and now not only um, not only do you guard this pawn, and this pawn guards the bishop, but the bishop is outside of this pawn chain. So instead of having the bishop behind, like here where it has no scope with the pawn in front, it's now outside where it keeps an eye on all these other squares. So it's very important that what you want to do 
is bring the bishop out and then have this bishop outside the pawn. So instead, Wagamon plays e5, so trades d4. Uh, this is all pretty standard, I think. What I would have recommended here for black is actually to play something like pawn here to prevent this idea of white bringing the bishop to harass the knight. Because in the game, what happens is once once white gets the bishop here, there's a lot of pressure on this critical pawn, and white can even white can even remove this knight here. Whereas if you go back um, and you play like a move like h6, there's no bishop g5. So now the knight here is very secure in guarding this pawn, and now you can complete your development. Pretty standard idea is bring the knight out, bring the bishop out, and you just keep going normal. Um, so instead, he plays bishop e7. Now h3 is played. Bishop h5, very reasonable move. Um, and Hathor plays knight b5. And this is one thing that I think is important for Hathor specifically, is it's very important to remember, when you don't see something, you don't want to just move pieces forward towards where you feel your enemy's pieces are. Because by moving the knight here, you just take the knight out of the central part of the board. It doesn't really attack anything. It's just an empty square where nothing is going on. Um, and you don't want to do that. So what you would like to do here with white is take this knight, takes, and now you just go bishop takes pawn, or not bishop takes, sorry, knight takes pawn, and um, and white is much better. Again, you're up one pawn here. If black tries to take this pawn, there's a classy tactic. So you can't recapture the bishop because of this pin of your knight to your queen. But what you can do in between is you can go g4, and pawn supports the pawn, you're attacking the bishop, and if the bishop moves, you just recapture, captures, captures, and you're ahead by one piece. Um, and also, if black just moves a bishop, you just take this one. So what you do here is, just, is by using the pawns, you break the pin on the diagonal towards your queen, and now you're going to win some kind of material in the middle of the board or on the side of the board. So Hathor should have done this. Instead, he plays knight to b5, a6, knight c3, bishop b2, queen e2. Big mistake, by the way. Um, what Hathor should have done in this position is he should have played knight takes, because now the knight and the queen both guard, Whereas in the game, after you take with the queen, now you lose this pawn on d4. Having said that, what, what something wrong with my webcam? What's wrong, you guys? Is something wrong? Am I not in enough? Okay. Um, so so um, so so having said that, however, at this point, oh, is the board off? Oh, sorry, the board is slightly off. You guys are right. Apologies. Sorry. Thank you. For, thank you for letting me know. Uh, let me move this over just a bit. Sorry about that. Um, Okay, all right, that's 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 perfect. I think. Okay, good. All right. Okay, so knight d4, queen d2. Knight takes bishop, pawn takes, and um, at this point, white is down one pawn, but the pawns are very loose. Like you, you have trouble defending them because white is still threatening to recapture and take this pawn. And if you were to push this one forward, white cannot capture, obviously, but white can remove this defender and take here takes and now take the pawn and it's back to even material so black actually is a big issue because this knight is so perfect it guards both of these pawns but white is attacking two or three times here so black can't actually save the pawn and that's why if you see the evaluation black is not really much better here so he castles and here Hathor makes a mistake he plays rook ae1 um, a better move also one this is a conceptual thing but when you're looking to move the rooks to center here you have to think about what is the ideal placement for the rooks. Because when you bring this rook here, now this rook cannot go to the center of the board. It's stuck on the edge. And ideally in this position, what you'd like is you want boom, boom. Your rooks are perfect. Let me just make some empty moves just so it's conceptually clear. If you get the rooks on the two center squares, they're really targeting everything on these two central lines. So the perfect placement almost always is you want the rooks on D1 and E1. Um, as opposed to having the rooks like this, because now this rook is kind of in jail. It can't come to the center, it doesn't attack, and now you lose all your threats towards this one because you really want this rook to, to be the third piece that just powers your attack in the center of the board. So he goes rook e1. Better would have been to play rook a d1, I believe. And um, again, same kind of thing. If black tries to play like rook e8, now you go rook e1, and the difference is very measurable because now you're attacking all these things in the center of the board, and um, this is very, very good for white. So so instead he goes rook e1. Wagamon plays rook e8. Fantastic move, by the way. Um, because now if white tries to take the knight and you take back and white takes, you take this pawn and black's still ahead by one pawn. But the reason that this move is such a good move and so deep is that at the end of the line, um, white can't get back this one because the rook will recapture your rook on e4. So that's why conceptually what you want to do is you want your rooks on the two open lines towards where the weaknesses are in the black camp, these two pawns, which are serious weaknesses. Um, because in the game, uh, at this point, it's very hard. You can maybe go back. You can maybe play f3 at some point, 
but it's it doesn't have the same momentum or the same same force. So at this point, Hathor goes queen e3, an unfortunate blunder. And I think the idea was he wanted to go rook d1, but white has wasted a move by putting the rook on e1. So again, you you always you want the rook here. So there's no point putting the rook all the way over. You you would like these rooks on the ideal squ placement squares, which are these two squares. So they attack these pawns on the central lanes. Um, so here he goes, rookie one, rookie eight, queen three. Now Wagamon plays d4. Fantastic move. The best move of the position, creating the fork of the queen and the knight. Queen guards the pawn. And now at this point, it's it's basically lost for white. White goes queen g3. Pawn takes knight. White goes here. I like Hathor's idea again, trying to trying to create a checkmate threat. White black can't capture because that puts the king in check. And Wagamon plays knight h5. Um, brilliant move. I mean... I don't even know if Brilliant's were just very, very good chess. Now, after rookie four here, Wagamama being very low on time makes a very minor mistake. Not really a mistake. He takes this pawn. Um, what he could have done was he could have created another fork. He could have gone knight here, fork the queen and the rook, or the even more powerful fork, pawn to f5, hitting the queen and the rook, and the pawn guards this one, and it's a complete disaster for um for for the mountain here. Instead he takes on b2, which of course is completely fine. Rook to e5, knight f6, queen d1. Not the best move. Considering the time situation, the fact that black is ahead by one piece, a better move would have been something like queen f3. Try to keep some pressure here. Um, in long term, maybe you can go after this pawn, but you just would like to keep your pieces more in the center of the board um, rather than trading the queens. But what I would say about this position is what I recommend for Wagamama is once again very similar. Same thing. You got this empty, you got this empty triangle with no dark square bishop anywhere on one of these squares. To support your king so what you would try to do here is this white is pesky you go bishop f8 offer the exchange if white doesn't take let's say white trades and moves the bishop now you go bishop here and you get the ideal setup the bishop inside this this triangle formation it also guards the pawn and now the black king is forever safe here the pawn fork is better than the knight fork because you get a rook or a queen for a pawn instead of giving up a horse uh so queen d1 they trade Rook d8, nice move by Wagamama, offers the rook exchange. If white takes, you make a grill with the check, and you capture the rook on d8 next move. So he goes rook here. Bishop a3, perfect move by Wagamama. Again, guards this pass pawn one square from queening. The white rook is super passive. It's stuck here. It's glued having to defend the pawn, so it's completely out of play. So now Hathor goes rook b2. Um, I think he just blundered the black and take. Uh, position is pretty hopeless anyway at this point, though, so there's not really much more that he could have done. He takes, trades, and um, not much more to be said. Really just a uh, pretty fundamentally good play by Wagamama. Just converts this. I mean, there's really nothing more to be said. I'll just give you guys the moves. Um, makes the queen, check, and queen e6, checkmate. I mean, very little to say about those last 20 moves. They were played perfectly. Uh, king can't go anywhere, obviously. The queen checks it on these two. Um, and uh, queen holds the squares, and the knight holds this critical d4 square. So it's just checkmate. So, um, so yeah, so, so Wagamon wins his first game. Very tough game for Hathor. Uh, unfortunately, he allowed this one fork in the middle of the game. And after he allowed that fork with pawn to d4, it was just, uh, just game over, unfortunately. So... Let's move on to the second game as well. Let's see, Wagamama TV. There we go. Okay, let's pull up the second game. Okay, so let's let's look at the second game then. Okay, so the second game, Wagamama has the white piece. So he plays pawn to d4, d5, bishop f4, bishop f5, knight f3, e6, e3. Again, same concept that I mentioned in the first game. Bishop is outside of the pawn chain, no longer behind. Much more scope from here than it would have had if it was on this square because it would be blocked in by these by these pawns so very good start knight f6 knight d2 standard standard queen b3 b6 castles standard knight g4 again not the move that i would say is best what hathor should have looked to do here is finish the development of the pieces and the way to do that would move the knight here let's say white goes rook here to target this open line because white white has made a concession he has these doubled pawns here but in return for the double pawns he has this open line for his rooks and potentially you could even double them up and make a lot of threats on the line. So here, black would go c5. And the point is, again, black can bring the rooks like this square and this square, maybe this square, and, and double it up and try to fight for this open line. Um, but you want to finish your development rather than playing knight to g4 here. Because when you play knight to g4 at this point, what happens is it's an empty threat. There are no threats towards the pawn on, pawn on h2 here. Um, 
because uh, because the knight just guards it. So it's, again, moving the knight to the rim of the board, but with no clear concept. So what he should have done is brought the knight here, finish the development so he can connect the rooks and bring them into play, and then play for one of these two pawn pushes. The knight on d7, it supports both of these pawn pushes very critically, either from this pawn or this pawn. So this would have been the, the better approach for Hathor to play. Instead, he goes knight g4, e4 by Wagamama. I mean, what can I say? Just a good move. Classy move. Starts trying to attack the center point. If black takes, you just undouble the pawns. And as I've said many times, these four squares are probably the most critical four squares in the game of chess. And white gets the big center. And the knights, guard, knight, knights both guard each other. And they guard the two critical pawns on d4 and e4. So instead he goes knight d7. Wagamon plays h3. Another perfect move. Knight h6. Not knight f6 because if you go back this way, white goes e5. Same thing. Classic, uh, classic fork with the pawn forking the queen and the knight. So he goes knight h6. Rook c1 is played here by Wagamama. Pawn takes, pawn takes, f5. Um, a good idea by by Ma the mountain to try and counteract the center. Unfortunately, in this case, it doesn't work. What he should have done again was try to get rid of this weakness. So this is what we call a backwards pawn. So when you look at these two pawns, they support each other, but there's no support. These pawns support, but there's no way the, the pawn does not support backwards. So this is a backwards pawn. So what you want to do when you have this pawn that's backwards like this is push it forward. So you get rid of the weakness on the square, and now you no longer have a backward pawn, and all your pawns harmonize and support each other, one in front of the other one. Um, yeah, trying to trap the knight. Yes, of course. That, that was a very good idea. H3 is a fantastic move because also... Uh, we have the saying, the knight on the rim is dim, and the knight has to go to the rim where it's out of play. Like, it's no longer attacking, and the, the odd thing is the pawn e4 also restricts any ideas of the knight coming back into the game. So this knight is just kind of out to lunch for a while, um, because this pawn just dominates the square, where it, which it needs to try and create pressure. So, so yeah, so c5 would have been the best move here. Instead, he plays e f5, and now Wagamama correctly plays pawn to e5. Best move, um, you hit the queen... Rook, you can't guard this pawn. You also have problems here, so you have to go queen e7 or queen d5. If queen d5, you trade, um, and white takes. And again, it's just so hopeless here for black. If you go like rook d8, for example, white can start pushing e6. Um, attacking the knight, if you move the knight, now I do the forky fork again with the pawn. I fork your two rooks, and it's just disaster every which way. If black goes knight b8, white can again even go e6. And look at this knight. No access points. The pawn dominates the knight. No access anywhere in this knight is just gone. It's just gone, girl, gone. Um, so instead, he plays queen e7. Rook takes c7 here. White's up a pawn. You have a big weakness here. Again, this is, again, a backwards pawn here. You, your pawn cannot support it backwards, so it's just a permanent weakness. Goes rook c8, rook c1. And now he tries queen e8. I mean, it's really already very hopeless for black. Um, but he tries queen c8. They trade. Uh, queen e6, king h8. If black goes knight f7 here, it's even worse because now white goes knight g5. You can't take the knight to the pin. The only way to guard is like queen f8. And now I think white can either take or take or even go knight f3. Um, and it's just probably knight f3 and it's just, it's, it's a disaster. You, your horses are all, all, all bottled up and, um, it's really, really bad. So instead he goes king h8, Wagamama plays knight c4. Another move that maybe not the absolute best move, but again, showing great understanding to bring the horse, uh, just activating it and jumping with it towards the center and then towards the black king. Uh, just very, very good. B5, knight d6, knight g8 is played by Hathor. I think Hathor at this point was feeling very, very nervous. There was one last trick to point out, which is black and check. King here and go check. And you'll notice that if king g1, it, this is the exact same uh, re repetition pattern that we had um in the in the game between xqc and um uh xqc and and uh uh who did he play sorry i already forgot between xqc and um and and finton easy with aces sorry so um yeah so okay so you see the same idea with the check uh with the draw unfortunately it doesn't work in this case for two reasons first of all white can go here check and block with the knight and the king is completely safe. And then secondarily, there's also the cute solution. Pawn g3, queen f3, queen e8, check. And if black blocks, you take knight g8 and you go knight f7. Same smothered checkmate. Um, so there are two ways to prevent it. But it is worth noting that this idea with this attempted a perpetual repetition with the yo-yo did exist in this game. 
Um, so instead, wa the, not Wagamama, sorry, Haftor goes knight g8, allowing knight f7, just ignores the queen, sees the smothered checkmate pattern, the king is stuck, no squares, no squares whatsoever. You have a ton of pieces protecting the king, but the knight just checks it from afar and the king gets stuck, and um, that's game over, and Wagamama wins the game, wins the match 2-0, and um, he gets the three points and takes the early lead in, I believe, Group A, if I'm not mistaken. So, um, very, very well played by Wagamama. I mean, almost nothing that I can be critical of in this game. Just very, 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 very solid chess. And I think, I will say without a doubt, Wagamama, for sure, is the odds-on favorite. Not even close at the moment, um, from what I've seen. But I do think there are players like Hafu, there are players like Hafthor who will the chance to keep improving. Uh, Easy with Aces also I think played very well, and I think once the once the nerves are out of the system, there will be competitors. But I'm gonna make the I'm gonna make the it's not even a hot take really, but that is my my early assessment is that Wagamama is for sure the clear favorite at the moment. So um, uh, favorite favorite Hafu Strong, uh, Hafu played well, but it was not it was not on the same level. Um, as Wagam Wagamama's play in these two games today. The play today was superb. Superb. I would I would argue honestly. I would argue honestly it's on it was on par. I mean there were no mistakes. Like I, I honestly think it's probably the best played game I've seen um so far. From from one side. Maybe not from both sides, but from one side in terms of cleanness. Uh it's a hundred percent the best game I've seen a player play from start to finish in Pog Champs one or in Pog Champs 2. So we're going to do a short poll, you guys, on who's going to win. Um, so let's see. Let's see. Dog Dog, or, or no, who will win? Sorry, we're talking about the Dog Dog versus TSM Zexro match, which I think is tomorrow. 67% uh, say Dog Dog and 2. 16% say Dog Dog and Armageddon. 9% uh, say TSM Zexro and 2. 7% say TSM Zexro and Armageddon. Okay, so we have a clear favorite, it looks like. Um... The clear favorite is that Dog Dog, it appears, is a consensus to win tomorrow. Um, so let's see. Okay, 74% say Dog Dog and 2. 13% say Dog Dog in Armegadon. 7% say TSM Zexthro in 2. Um, let's see. Let's see. Okay, let's see what's going on. Let's take one more look at this. Okay. So the poll's looking pretty pretty heavy. Dog dog in two. 73% of you think dog dog is gonna win in two. 13% of you guys think dog dog and Armageddon. 8% say Zexro in two. 6% say Zexro and Armageddon. No love for Zexro. Wow, okay. Um yeah, Hearthstone Streamer, Fortnite Streamer. Yeah, it's going to be a good match. Um, now, as we know, to be fair to Zextro, he is a last-minute replacement. I will dominate. Dom dropped out, um, I think he dropped out maybe two or three days ago. So, um, so yeah, I think uh, I think for sure it's it's going to be tough for Zextro. He's the last-minute replacement. But big shout-out to Zextro, of course, stepping in when Dominate drops out. So, it's going to be... Um, it's going to be a fun match. Clearly, you guys think uh, Dog Dog and 2. Uh, Coach Wagamama, please. I just said Wagamama is the clear favorite. If Wagamama is the clear favorite, um, am I going to... Am I going to predict him to win? Also, you guys, we have another match. We're going to do another poll. Do you guys think TF Blade is going to win, or do you think Cutie Cinderella is going to win? Let's see. Um, let's see. Let's see what the what the odds are. This one, I think, is very unclear, very messy, and hard to judge. Um, I started playing chess when I was 7 years old, you guys. So let's see. 49% say TF Blade in 2. 41% say Cutie in, in 2. Okay, very very close one as well. I'm kind of curious to see what you guys what you guys think. In the meantime, thank you to No Name Potato for the 5 Fatal Theory for the Tier 1. Hey, the Pogfather for the 2 months. Nathan F for the 10 months. Grown Up for the Prime. Ben ben Haiku for the 4 months. Dioman for the gift of sub to Wagamama TV. Thank you to Kane Merck for the 4 months. And thank you to Senor Frogs for the 2 months as well. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Okay, so TF Blade appears to be the, the odds-on favorite, according to you guys, but it's not clear. Okay, 52% of you guys say TF Blade in 2. 35% of you guys say Cutie Cinderella in 2. 8% say TF Blade in Armegadon. 4% say Cutie Cinderella in Armegadon. Um, so pretty close. Very, very close, actually. So 52 to 35. Um, uh, very, 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 it's going to be a competitive match. So that's the second match. I think there's a third match tomorrow that I'm, it, oh no, we did, we did polls on all of them. So three matches tomorrow are going to be Cutie Cinderella versus TF Blade, Mizzy Wizzy against, out against, against, uh, Austin Show, 
um, and TF Blade against Cutie Cinderella. Going to be going to be a fun day of matches, um, and we're definitely looking forward to it. I will again be doing commentary as, as always. Um, so so yeah, what 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 am I, Coach Wagamama? But Wagamama is the favorite. I mean, he's he honestly he's a fa- he's a big favorite. Not not to not to like not to put pressure on Wag- Wagamama, but he's the big favorite right now. Like big favorite. He's the big favorite. Um, especially con- considering considering the fact that um considering the fact that uh Hafu very nervous I think and Wagamom is like all there he's just all there chill like he's he was honestly when I saw him doing commentary I'm, today, I'm like wait a second is Wagamom really not a chess player because he was like doing his commentary and it was it sounded like he could have been a pro chess player as well it was just like so chill do this I'll do that idea the explanations were, were spot on um so so yeah all right you guys i'm gonna get a little bit more coffee i think and i will uh be right back actually just drink too much so i'm gonna run to the restroom as well be right back one second 